the first uh, speaker that I'm really privileged to introduce is somebody, again, that I interviewed for the magazine, uh, got to know in person at our conference a year ago. Uh, he's a magnificent guy. Dr. Columbus Batiste is the chief of cardiology for Kaiser Permanente Riverside and Moreno Valley uh, Medical Centers, was co-founder in 2011 and continues as director of the Integrative Cardiovascular Disease Program at Kaiser Permanente Riverside. He earned his doctorate of medicine at Loma Linda University Medical School and is board certified internist, cardiology, cardiologist, and interventional cardiologist. He received the Kaiser Permanente Physician Exceptional Contribution Award in 2017 and the NAACP Community Health Service Award in 2016. He is convinced that cardiovascular disease, as well as stroke, hypertension, and diabetes are preventable conditions, which are major causes of death in the United States, disproportionately affecting African Americans, and he is co-founder of the Slave Food Project, documenting the racial dimensions of healthcare disparities in the US, and he was featured in the celebrity documentary, The Game Changers. And by the way, many of you know, whenever, whenever I'm introducing a cardiologist, it kind of came to mind, you know, we just lost a treasure, the legend, uh, Tony Bennett, just passed away, and a you know, legendary crooner. And I don't know how many of you know, but he was a vegetarian and a, a, prom ad a prominent advocate for animal rights and that, it's just an overall treasured human being. And I don't know if a lot of you know, my father pointed this out to me some years ago, that when, when Dr. Christian Barnard was the, did the first heart transplant, it was something really far afield from what we do in lifestyle medicine, but Tony Bennett wrote a song uh, a famous song that really never got the attention of his other song, but it was called uh, I Left Your Heart in San Francisco. So that's just kind of what Tony Bennett did. I don't know. But in any event, Dr. Batiste is like Ron Weiss. He practices and teaches from the heart. Um, he is just, he fits in perfectly with here, and it is a real privilege to see him again and introduce him to you, Dr. Columbus Batiste. Greetings. How's everyone doing? Come on now. You're not stuck in the airport. All right? You're above ground. So I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be here. So I'll have to, I have to admit, I'm a city boy. It's my first time on the farm. Turn the lights off. It was pitch dark. <laughs> pitch dark. The whole time out there, the next thing I know, I hear this little chirping that's going on, I'm, and it's starting to lull me to sleep, and I needed that relaxation. I need that relaxation. So it's good to be here. I don't want this to be my last time at Ethos Farm. You're doing wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, I'm old school, I don't do this a whole lot in terms of this, but I'm told I'm supposed to say, follow me at Healthy Heart Doc, but I don't like that kind of stuff. But let's go ahead and let's, let's dig into things. So I wanna give you guys a little insight. Growing up as a kid, we would always have dinners. We'd have Sunday dinner, we'd have dinners after church, we'd have dinners for family dinners. And I remember there was a kid table, and then there was the adult table. I always was at the kid table being the youngest, Right? That was a pleasant surprise. So my, my brother is 16 years older than I am. My sister is 13 years older. I was a, I guess I had a mistake. I said pleasant surprise. Right? And so I would sit there listening to the adults as they were having all of this magical conversations, like they were solving the world's problems. So it's not surprising that when I became an adult, I started having, guess what? Dinners. We started having Sunday dinners. And I never forget, my wife and I had been married we finally moved into our, our, our current house, and we decided to have some friends over from college. Now, we hadn't seen these individuals at all in nearly 15 years. We had surrounding the table. I went to a historically black college and university. I was very quiet, didn't say much at all. And we had doctors. We had principals. We had lawyers. We had certified public accountants. We had architects. We had uh, principals, we had all these people sitting around the table and we're having good conversations, reminiscing. Then all of a sudden someone said, it was a lawyer, Mark, a lawyer. <laughs> all right, he said, I have a question for you, docs. 
what's the deal with black people? Now we're all black. And I'm like, what is he talking about? <laughs> this guy is always one for the loony bin. He said, why is it that I went to a doctor and they're telling me I'm at greater risk for everything, for colon cancer, for prostate cancer, for heart disease, and I asked my other colleagues, and they said, no, I didn't have to have that test done. He said, what's the deal? And so the conversation really started as to why is it, this is before the pandemic, now this is kind of passe, why is it that some people live sicker and die sooner than other people? Now, we understand that this equates to almost everyone. It's not just African Americans, but it's many people. And we know there's many causes. There's many causes when we look into this. We look at employment disparities start happening as we start getting to, to some of our business individuals that were there, right, who hire. My wife and her friend, they, they, they do some of the HR business. We look at financial disparities. This is where the public accountants started coming in. We look at education. This is where the principals started talking. And housing, the real estate moguls in, that were in the, at the table and the architects. Uh, then, then the city planners started talking about airspace and green space and all these things, and I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, this is a cause of disparities? It started off in a moment that the first thing who spoke up was the real estate agent and, and the, uh, and the uh, architect. And he said, well, yeah, Columbus, here's the reason why. Do you understand that years ago there was this thing called redlining, that where people could buy homes in certain areas and other people could not buy homes in those areas? And when studies have been done now, they overlap the maps and they identify those same areas that were historically red mapped have a higher burden of, guess what? Diabetes, heart disease, emphysema, cancer, blood pressure. We start seeing this stroke. We see that it exactly overlies, almost like you're lining it up as a child and doing this map and you're drawing things out. They said, this is significant. Uh, so then, then the, the city planner got in and said, well, you know, it's not just that, that, that you remember Pete Buttigieg got in, in trouble like a while ago when he said that highways are racist, right? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with concrete. The concrete doesn't have any problems, but you look at the air quality in terms of that some of the planning bisected and dissected areas of communities that are at higher risk, creating, guess what, pollution. And so when we look at pollution, you're like, well, smog, have you, how many of you guys have ever flown into I'm going to call it out, LAX. And you go from clear skies to like this little brown haze that's there, right? You start diving into the brown haze. That's not fog like we have here. <laughs> that, that's actually smog. It's called smog in that moment. So the air quality plays a role. And so what exactly does air quality do? Well, the crazy part is the Bible of cardiologists called the Journal of American College of Cardiology actually did studies describing how it causes stress that actually pollution and air quality actually can increase the stress levels in the body and impact the lining of the vessels. And that this increases the rate of heart attacks. Okay, so you're like, well, that's everybody, doc. That's not just one particular area. You say, well, what about green spaces, parks? So I grew up inside of a little city inside of LA, a suburb called Compton, California. And this area there in Compton, California, it was right next to an area they used to call an unincorporated area. There were no greenways, there were no parks, there were no sidewalks at all inside this area. I didn't think anything of it. That's just life. It's where I grew up. Everything was normal. But what studies have increasingly told us is that when you live in these areas without greenery, without trees, without grass, that the heat index is much higher. Now, here's the thing about the heat index. We've been suffering with this heat wave across the United States. Do you realize that for every one degree Celsius of increased heat, that you increase your risk of a heart attack by about 2.5% or annualized about 5% nearly? That what begins to happen is we start to see this vicious cascade, increased risk of clotting, increased risk of the lining of the vessels, spasming. So these areas begin to become focused more and more inside these areas. And so then another city planner spoke up who was still there, and he just said, you know what? What about the noise? I'm not talking about the crickets, but the noise from the trains going by, right? The trains just coursing through the airplanes. I grew up in Compton. There was actually a, an airport. You hear planes going. You hear all the noise. And so the noise does much of the same thing. That it actually increases by 34% the city living urban living, the risk of heart attacks and strokes. You're like, okay, 
that's everyone. Well, now, now the business people started speaking up, right? And so the accountants started speaking up. And they said, well, listen, here's a major issue. The major issue is the financial disparities that we're seeing that people who are financially distraught have a lot of stress, and it makes sense. If I don't have money to pay for stuff, I'm in a world of hurt. And so we see that this increased risk, and so studies have shown that African-American men, three times the amount of heart attacks, three times that we start to see this, that when we look at being unemployed, increased risk for heart attacks too as well. But then now we look at the educators spoke up once again. I don't know if you guys have ever read this book, Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, Brown University, incredible book from a historical perspective, incredible book. And he really goes through the entire history of, of how our current state is and how uh, redlining occurred. It's very interesting from his perspective in looking at did our practices happen by de jure, by law, or by de facto, just by chance. But what's interesting is that his own university went and did a follow-up. And they did a study and they looked at, well, let's see what happens from the educational system. And they found that those who were impacted by redlining policies on educational outcomes, including school district funding, school diversity and performance, it demonstrates that districts and schools currently located in formerly redlined neighborhoods have significantly less per pupil revenues. Revenues. Resources go where value is placed. It's going to be a repeated theme. Resources go where value is placed. Larger shares of black and non-white student bodies, less diverse student populations, and lower average test scores compared to those in neighborhoods that were not redlined. What's the result of this? Less education, more business for me. Less education, more heart disease. Less education, it becomes a predictor, it's multifactorial, of increased heart disease. But what's the common thread? There's a common thread that sits inside all of this. Six letter word called stress. Stress. Now I know you guys look very comfortable, but I will tell you, how many of you guys have experienced stress in the past hour? All right, all right, how many of you guys, oh, there you go, yes. <laughs> how many of you guys have experienced stress in the past week? Year? I just experienced stress the past three days in a row flying here, okay? <laughs> stuck in the airport, seeing people stranded and so forth. Uh, so stress is six letter word that becomes there. So what does stress mean? Stress is simply, stress is a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that the demands that uh, exceed personal resources that you can mobilize. So stress is simply demands minus resources. All right, simply put, your bills are $2,000, but you bring home 1500 you get off work at 3 o'clock, but you have to pick the kids up at 2 o'clock. That's stress. That's stress inside that moment that's there. And so what begins to happen many times when you experience stressful situations? So what happens, I always describe a stressful state for me. Are we in a safe environment? Is this, can I share with you all today? All right, so I know that we're vegans. I know... I know we're plant-based, but I have to tell you, I was a kid and I watched this movie called Ben. And Ben, back in the 70s, I snuck and watched this movie. I wasn't supposed to. Ben was about this boy who had a relationship with rats. And these rats started attacking people and eating them. I'm a little boy and I get scared out of my mind. Now, anytime I see a rodent, I jump. In that moment, I got so scared I would run as a kid. As an adult, I went to school. I changed majors when they said there was a rat, gonna be rats I, I'd have to look at. <laughs> As a grown man, a cardiologist, we go out in our backyard, we live on the hillside of mountains. There sometimes are rodents back there. I jump up on the table. <laughs> now, this is a safe environment. It's a safe environment. So, what, why do I do that? Because the amygdala goes into overdrive, the amygdala is hijacked. And so, inside those moments, I remember all the experiences, and so when I feed that sensory input, all of a sudden, it, it ceases my rational brain from thinking, my prefrontal cortex, and I go back to what's called the limbic, the hind system, where the amygdala houses all of these fears and apprehensions. And so we understand that this is kind of the process of what happens, and it triggers, it turns the key for the whole stress hormone cascade. And my wife was just saying that she had to get up and give a talk at this conference unexpected, and she said she froze. 
I said, well, that's natural. We give people a, a, a stress test by having them do public speaking. Uh, and all of a sudden, right, pupils dilate. All of a sudden, the blood vessels crimp down, creating a hypertensive state. The liver begins to mobilize blood sugar, creating a diabetic state. And so this is important. It's useful, extremely positive when you need to perform. And this is what we do, a balancing act. The stress can be beneficial. And it's this allostasis is our response to it of how we adapt, how our body is always seeking for this level of homeostasis. And that's a good thing. That's called eustress. But too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And we understand that, that when we become overwhelmed and overburdened, that all of a sudden our backs break under the tension. And we move from performance to burnout. We move from performance to burnout. And that's what part of the problem. What's the result of this increased load? This increased load that's persistent has been shown to be related. This is where the psychologists came in. It's related to every disease state on earth. We see it in terms of preterm birth, inflammatory diseases, neurologic diseases, diabetes, heart disease. We see all of these things have an increased burden that's there. I'm here to tell you that your health is equals your resiliency divided by your stress. Health equals resiliency divided by stress. And so chronic exposure to stress, yes, it increases disease. That yes, when you re re meet adversity and vulnerability, but here's the key, loneliness. Ah, loneliness. Yeah, loneliness is like smoking 15 cigarettes to stay out of Utah. We understand the impact and the burden when you don't, can't congregate together. We were just talking about the impact of COVID, how we couldn't come together. We lost so much connection. And that loss of connection resulted in increased burden of disease. That equates even your response to infectious diseases. It relates to your response to blood pressure. We see this in poor outcomes. It's also been associated with increased cancer, that we see this, that chronic stress activates signaling pathways that elevate the expression of downstream oncogenes. When we are under persistent stress, how do we deal with this thing called stress? Self-perceived permanent stress. Now, why do we call it self-perceived? So never forget, I was, a, I was an intern in, uh, right out of med school. And so I'm there, I'm up. This is back when you had to walk backwards, uphill, in snow, to get your medical degree and license and everything of that sort. And so I was up about 40 hours straight back in those days. I remember driving home. My sister said, she said, Clovis, did you take care of such and such for dad and mom? I said, really, you're asking me this? Do you know I've been up all night, what I'm doing, if, and people are going to die and everything else? She said, Columbus, you're not the only one who's stressed out. I have a young baby at home. If I'm not watching the baby, something bad can happen. I didn't get mad and say, why are you comparing that to me? I realized that stress is something that you perceive individually. It's something you perceive. That means I can be in the midst of a crazy crashing, burning patient case, I'm less stressed than the barista at Starbucks, right? It's a perception that's there. So this perception, perceived stress, it also is a predictor of diabetes. We see that it's an increased risk for stroke too as well, and that close to the heart, it's increased risk for heart disease, inner heart study. Both stress at home and stress at work predicts your level of heart attacks at the same level as other risk factors. Stress is important. This is the garb I wear. That's why I have to go and get, make sure I get massage therapy and stretch because I'm wearing this lead when I'm doing cases. This is what ends up happening, is that stress also, I wasn't taught this in med school, but what stress does is stress can also lead to a broken heart. Uh, something called Takotsubo disorder, that uh, mounting under extreme emotional stress can impact you so much that it can actually cause the heart to become paralyzed and begin to pump outward instead of inwardly, despite the coronary arteries being normal. Stress can be a killer, but stress can be our friend. So when we look at this, overall, how does this happen? All roads lead to the heart. What's that thing called before? Endothelium, the lining of the heart. You've heard, you've heard likes of the greats, Esselstyn and others, talk about the endothelium, right? I'm a simple guy from humble beginnings. How many of you guys have ever used something like this? Teflon pan. You're not using it now, but you've used it in the past, right? <laughs> Nothing sticks to it. Now, before you guys became saved and became enlightened, you might have fried some eggs on there, might have put some, some, some cheese on there and all this other stuff, and nothing would stick to it at all. 
uh, until, until it gets worn down. And that's very similar to the heart, to the artery lining the heart, that it's impermeable, nothing impermeable, nothing sticks to the lining of the vessels of the heart. It resists everything. It says no. It releases something called nitric oxide and causes the vessels to dilate when they need to and constrict when they need to. It's so powerful. And so as doctors, we can check this. We almost never do it, but we can check it. Something called flow mediated media dilatation. It's like you have a, a garden hose and it gets baking out in the sunlight. When you step on it before it bakes in the sunlight, it's distensible. It squeezes. But once it's in there and gets hard, you can press all you want and nothing happens to it that garden hose. The same thing happens with the arteries of the, of the body, that when they become diseased, they become rigid and they do not uh, move whatsoever at all. And this is what this test somewhat uh, uh, examines in that moment. But when that pan starts to look like this, it's been used uh, and your arteries take on a look, all of a sudden things change. Now the studies have shown that mental stress, it impairs the lining of the vessels the same way that disease does. That when you put someone under mental stress and you test that thing called the endothelium, it no longer becomes reactive. It's burdened by the stress, by the allostatic load in those moments. That all of a sudden, the, that when you're depressed and anxious, that same level of stress manifestation, once again, the vessels no longer expand well. Stress is important. And when they look at our youth, the lower your stress levels, the higher your level of endothelial function. And the inverse is correct too as well, that the higher your stress, the poorer that function of the arteries are. So we've mapped it all out. We see that there is a major relationship between chronic stress and just the lining of the vessels and what can lend itself towards this issue. So what's, what's the issue with that? It's predictive of everything on earth, that when you have a, the problem with the arteries, it's an increased risk for, for cardiovascular events. We know it's an increased risk for high blood pressure. It's an increased risk for diabetes. We know that it's, it impacts everything from stroke, dementia, <clears throat> erectile dysfunction, sleep apnea, all across the board are all tied to this common pathway called the endothelium. And when we have the dysfunction of it, that's the problem. Our health is tied to our resiliency divided by our stress. The higher our stress, the poor our health. The higher our stress, the poor our health. That applies to all of us, that this stress is uniquely related, but there is a unique stressor that some segments of the population face. There's an added stressor. It could be a gender. It could be gender identity. It could be any of these things, but it also can be the color of your skin. Uh, that this idea of discrimination and racism also impacts us from a level of stress. It's an added stress. Racism is a statement about a person's value. And resources often go where value is perceived, right? So people always ask the question, why don't all doctors talk about nutrition? Well, it's because nutrition is not valued. Resources go where value is placed. Follow me for a second. In medical school, what's the goal of every doctor? to pass the boards. What do the boards test? Do they test nutrition and lifestyle? No. Are we gonna pour resources into studying for this, something that is not tested? No. So now you enter into residency and fellowship. What happens? What's your goal? Is to become board certified. So once again, what do the boards test? Do they test lifestyle? Historically, no. So now where do resources go of time and effort? They don't go to there. They go to procedures and pills. Then you get out and practice for the average person, unless you're Dr. Weiss, <laughs> right? What happens? You're reimbursed based off of what you do, procedures and pills and these metrics that are there. Resources go where value is placed. Resources go where value is placed. It's not just there. So we see this overall, that lifetime discrimination has been associated with increased burden of high blood pressure. Study performed out of Journal of American uh, Heart Association, Jackson Heart Study, uh, know with this, that whether you go from low to medium or medium to high, you see an increased burden and risk that's there. That here's the crazy part. Studies have shown that individuals who re report increased emotional stress, now that's funny right there. So my wife always says to me, she says, you know, one of these days you have a, an issue with flies and one day you're going to be up talking and a fly is going to go into your mouth and you're going <laughs> to wig out and I'm going to laugh. And that almost happened just in that moment right there. <laughs> I didn't quite wig out. 
you, some of you may have missed it right there, right? So, so we, that was almost a stress moment right there. See that? <laughs> and so we see that these things begin to happen. It also shows the increased risk with coronary calcification. We see increased risk of dying from cardiovascular events. This has all been shown a relationship with discrimination. We see discrimination equals stress. Now, some of you may be saying, I kind of feel like that can't be true, Doc. I'm not quite sure, right? Show me the proof. Is there proof for this? And so we look and we sit, we sit here and say, well, let's understand the basics. We told you about this already, about what happens when you recognize something. So if I'm in an experience and I'm treated a particular way, many stories I could tell you about my personal experience as a physician. Of, of going and doing, I'll never forget one time, so I'm the regional chief of cardiology, and so I don't usually use titles or anything else like that an awful lot. Um, I get introduced that way. So I, I have a, a level of, of expertise, and I never forget a patient walking by, a patient was there, and the patient said to me, could you grab the, the trash? Or could you, could you kind of empty that? I said, sure, no problem. So get, get that taken care of. And the nurse came in and said, what are you doing, doctor? And the, the patient looked startled. You're the, you're the doctor? Yeah, but I'm not too humble to take out the trash. I do it at home every day, trust me. My wife says, take out the trash, I take out the trash, right? But you see that this begins to, to, to load into your psyche. You now begin to recognize these instances and you start to predict them before they ever happen. And another example, I never forget being on a cruise with my, my wife and some friends years ago. There was someone who had a Southern accent, deep Southern accent. He had a Texas Longhorn had on, pulled down, and he was just staring. I was like, what's going on? I was like, oh boy, here we go. My mind started jumping. He comes over, I'm like, oh boy, here we go. See, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I mean, but okay, come on, I'm gonna get ready, I'm gonna get ready. And so he gets up, he's like, how y'all doing? I said, oh, good. He goes, my wife just says she loves your wife, she likes your wife's bikini. Where y'all from? We should have dinner together. I felt horrible because I discriminated against him. I made an assumption that was not valid in that moment, but I created this stressful state in my body, irrespective based on perception in that moment. So we see this, it increases the risk of aging. We see that it's not just those, but even if I personally have not been impacted by it, because I've witnessed it on television, I now relate to scenarios that have been there, and this is what it shows inside of studies. And so once again, our Bible, Journal of American College of Cardiology, has shown that stress from just living in lower socioeconomic status, that they've identified that when you live in these crucibles of conflict, these areas, that we see that once again, it triggers the stress cascade we see that it impacts the flow media dilatation, and it actually triggers acute heart attacks by mental stress itself. That stress equals demands minus resources. The higher our stress, the poorer our health. So, so what's the answer? What do you do when you get stress? What do you turn to when you get stress, right? Many of us turn to fake resources. Uh, what do I mean by that? Yeah, come on now, we've heard this before, the motivational triad. We exert the least amount of effort uh, we're seeking to avoid pain, and we seek pleasure. I don't want to have a conversation. I'll sit down and watch Netflix. I don't want to go and, and pick any vegetables from the garden. I'm going to go and a drive through and swipe my card. Least amount of effort, immediate satisfaction in that moment. Many people turn to alcohol. A recent study right now just came out that told us from Journal of American Medical Association, told us that, that the level and impact of alcohol consumption as a as a means of alleviating stress has increased exponentially. That we're seeing that it leads to bad habits, that we're seeing that people oftentimes go on a double date with Ben and Jerry when they get home, <laughs> right? That they, they, because stress is simply dessert spelled backwards. That this idea that stress, our nutrition, can either add to our resiliency or add to our stress, but we choose nutritional stress many times. What is it? Eating disease-forming foods, but it's also not eating health-promoting foods is what we see. So when we turn our attention back to African-American culture, that many people think soul food is our heritage. But here's one of the key things, is that the heritage is distorted, that when we go back, we understand food is used as life, just like it is here. That when we go back, we find just enriched vegetables and nutrients that are there on the soils in Africa and many other continents that are there that haven't been used. You look historically, we see that also food has been used as chains. Uh, we use foods to tempt our kids or to control our kids, don't we? 
before you become enlightened, you give them a candy bar to be quiet and here you go, let me give you a candy. Uh, we give them other things to kind of hush them up in those moments. We use it as a way of control. Food that can be used as control. Frederick Douglass said that uh, he recounted rations consisted of monthly allowance of a bushel of third rate corn, pickled pork, and poorest quality herrings. Uh, and so as time evolved and history moved on, we saw that this idea, the rise of the Sunday dinner, we saw that during slavery periods, the enslavement period, that people were given higher portions during the holiday times and on the weekends that they oftentimes start having these gatherings. That then translated over into weekend dinners where you brought your best and you shared it, which is a good thing. But oftentimes these foods focus on the foods that were there out of burden, not out of resiliency. The key is, the interesting part is at the beginning of the turn of the century, many African Americans had a better dietary quality than others because they lived on the land. They were there inside the farms and had more fruits and vegetables and built off a resiliency that was there. They ate like a pauper so they could live like a king. I wonder why my grandmother lived into her 90s despite everything she went through. I wonder why many live well. They, but when we look at the rise of soul food, as people began to migrate over into through great migration, my folks moved from Louisiana to California, some moved to, to New York and other places, that they became early adopters of fast food, where cultures intermingled and they lived in areas where they could not grow, where they had to, to succumb to just having solely um, uh, uh, era quick fryers that were there. And so we understand that these things began happening, and then when the conflicts happened in the 60s, we said, well, there's an idea Richard Nixon said, great book that was there called Supersizing Urban America. We'll show that in just a moment. He said that any act of, of racism is an act of communism. And he said, we have to rebuild the cities, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, but these small business association loans went where? To liquor stores as opposed to grocery stores because of the profit margins that were there. And so we became a fast food uh, agency. So we began to supersize urban America creating food deserts and food swamps, food apartheid, some would say. And when we look at recent studies, one out of every five African-American households is situated in the food desert. That means that you can get fast food faster than you can get a fresh fruit and vegetable. That when we look at this, that for every 1% increase in Caucasian population, there was a 17% decrease in the density of fast foods. Our dietary guidelines are dysfunct because they tell us one thing and do the other that we see that the support and the subsidies, they go elsewhere as opposed to where they need to. It's what we're seeing on a regular basis and that if we were to follow the foods derived from their, their recommendations, what they support, their subsidies, there's a high burden of diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. But it's not just those, for those of you who are, are vegan, all right, it's also the vegan burgers and fries, it's the vegan ice cream, and everything else that burdens us too as well. These studies we are well familiar with that what happens is if we're consuming that, we may be saving the planet and saving the animals, but we're not saving ourselves is one of the key things. That nutritional stress damages our endothelium. It creates stressful environment inside of our system that studies have shown, recent say just came out looking at antioxidants in 2020, talking about the impact of meat, the deleterious impact of meat creating oxidative stress in the body. Oxidative stress. Do you understand that what happens is, here's, here's one of the key things. I have to get this in here. I'm giving way too many analogies here, but this is important. You know why blueberries, raspberries, strawberries are so important? Why green leafy vegetables are important? I'm giving an example. Beyonce is on a tour right now. We know who Beyonce is, don't we? <laughs> Do we know who LeBron is? Yeah. All right. Do you know I can call you know, all these people by singular names? Now, what do celebrities come with? Bodyguards. You can't get close to celebrities because they have bodyguards. The bodyguards are fending off anything that's working against them, that's trying to attack them. Well, here's the thing. When you eat the celebrities of the food aisle, they have singular names. Blueberries, <laughs> raspberries, strawberries, beans. But they come armed too as well. They come armed with their gang of bodyguards called antioxidants. And they're like, come and try and step up to me, free radicals. See what's going to happen. We're going to take you out and take you down. And that's the same thing what happens. And so when you don't consume that, we're setting ourselves up for a burden of disease. And when we have this on a repetitive basis, we're lending ourselves to cardiovascular disease. That things called fat, salt, and sugar impact our vessels just as well, impair our endothelium with salt. 
that when we have sugar-sweetened beverages, it impairs our endothelium, that when we have saturated fat, which is primarily found in animal proteins, it impairs our endothelium. We see this, that living near these fast food places increases our risk of heart attacks. It's time to stop and reclaim our health and our heritage. It's not just the heritage of one. We understand that the most long-lived individuals around the world eat very similarly. They eat from the land prim primarily. They move, they socialize, they get rid of the isolation. Uh, they empower those who are more senior in the community. They empower the women too as well. We have to do it, but it's never too late to change the direction we're going in as a country, as a community at all. We have to be intentional. We have to return to the basics, uh, rice and beans and, and root vegetables and green leafy vegetables, and I told you the power of those as well. And when we do this and supply it to everyone, here's the thing, if we can make it accessible to everyone that when we do social produce prescriptions on diet and food security, guess what happens? It's no surprise that all of a sudden we start seeing that, that it increases the fruit and vegetable consumption, it decreases food insecurity, and it improves the self-reported health, that we're seeing this improvement in diabetes, blood pressure, as well as body mass index, that we see that when we look at the cost, people say, well, the cost is too much, it's prohibitive. Wonderful work that Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is doing. This is hot off the presses. 16% decrease in total food costs when you engage in eating plant-rich foods. Now, I'm not talking about all that processed vegan food that's there. That costs $20 for something this small, but I'm seeing food from the earth, simple things that, that we had. I have greens every, my mom is 88. Uh, I wish I had put a video of my mom up right now. She's great. She's like, she's like, my purpose is to make sure I make you food. And my siblings just, they just shake their heads. She lives with me. I don't live with my mom, right? She lives with me. My mom lives with me. I don't live with my mom. I want to be clear, all right? And so she will cook up greens and beans and everything. So tofu, stock palette for me for the week. I love it, love it, love it. And we understand that when we begin to subsidize these foods and we shift our priorities, we push resources to where it's valuable, all of a sudden we start to see a change in the shift, a seismic shift, that these green leafy vegetables, we understand just one cup is going to increase the dietary nitrates, decrease your cardiovascular events, that we understand fruits and vegetables decreasing mortality overall, decreasing in terms of cardiovascular events. We understand it lowers the blood pressure, that it's going to improve your diabetes. We understand that kids, our kids, teach them young, right? That uh, the fruit-based lunch reduces that risk and that for cardiovascular events, it's helpful for us overall. Our whole grains, we can't be afraid of carbs. Carbs are not our enemies. Garbage is. Garbage is. Not carbs, right? It's important to remember. So we're sitting here, what about beans? It's the superhero food. Don't be afraid of beans. Now, some of you may not want to eat beans. So you're like, well, I don't want to pass any gas. I'm still dating. I got my significant other here. But listen, let them know that means that it's working to your good, right? It's, it's, there's nothing wrong. That's the bodily function that's happening, that when we do this, we see a lower burden and risk of coronary heart disease and overall risk of total cardiovascular events as we ingest these beans, nuts as well. Now, here is my caveat with nuts. I am a snackaholic, like I am a sugarholic. You put a can of nuts, especially if it's roasted or something else on there, I will go through the whole entire can. So you don't do it that way. You have to have raw, unsalted. You want to sprinkle it on top of your salads. You want to go ahead and have it that, that's there. If you consume it, it is a high dense food. If you want to do it the right way, go old fashioned. Pick the walnuts off the tree, <laughs> crack them open, and have at it. <laughs> but you buy it from a can, take a different approach. But we understand that basically about two or three tablespoons is about all that you need, and that provides tremendous value that's there. Don't forget the spice of life. Variety is the spice of life, but the spices, you want the different colors. There's so much power inside the different spices, even beyond turmeric, which I love and cayenne, and paprika, and garlic. I mean, just when you look at the components of the allium, fa allium family, and you look at all these things and what they can provide in terms of benefit, there's power. That's how you add flavor to your food. You become a food scientist. And I encourage you to play around with your food, adding these different flavors that are devoid inside processed refined foods. You don't get them there. 
that when you begin doing this, all of a sudden we understand that disparities go away. This concept of why black people live sicker and die sooner, yes, it's stress, a large component of why people live sicker and die sooner. That has become grossly evident since the pandemic. It's because the central core principle is our nutrition. We have to have a change in our perspective and value what's important to us. What's important to you? That when we do this, irrespective of ethnic groups, we see a drop down in our chronic disease, a drop down as well as inside of cardiovascular events. Love a wonderful story. Um, and many of you guys probably recall this in terms of work that was done uh, looking at swapping the diets of African Americans, one inside of uh, South Africa, one inside of uh, urban America, and swap the diets over to a fiber-rich plant predominant diet that you were able to switch and turn off the colon cancer genes, right? We saw that that was there. But here's the one I love the most. How many of you guys know that there was a vegan prison? Well, oh, one hand. So years ago, there was a whole boom about saying, what can we do about, about prisons? Now, in prisons, I can go down a whole other rabbit hole about, about uh, disparities in terms of the incarcerated. But when we looked, there was an idea. People were going in, and they were getting contracts to fund supplying, taking over the, the prisons and the food and so forth. So an individual decided, I'm going to fund, I put a bid in. He lost one bid, and they were like, he wanted to provide vegan food. They were like, no way. The prisoners will never do it. He finally found one in San Bernardino. How many of you guys have heard of San Bernardino? <laughs> oh, good. You understand what, what's located in San Bernardino? The Blue Zone, Loma Linda, California. It's an oasis within the county of San Bernardino, which is a distraught community. And so what's interesting is that he, he, he got this bid for this contract at this prison, and he divided the groups. The prisoners had the option. 85% chose to go down the vegan arm. Now, it wasn't just vegan. They also looked at nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, looked at trust in God, looked at um, all of these things, air quality, rest, and temperance. And he put them through this compared to the group that didn't. What he found was the recidivism rate went from 95% to 2%. Wow. That all of a sudden, the individuals who were part of that group, they wanted to be a part. Everyone was amazed. They were thriving. There was no more racial conflict. These wars inside of prison didn't really happen in the groups when they did this. Crazy. This is real. You can search for it, right? And, and so all of a sudden, guess why, guess why it was uh, defunded? Because something about a telephone bill. The power and the impact of changing lives, of putting people back into the communities, reform, new lease on life was tremendous inside those moments just by changing. At the central core was nutrition, but support of support groups, eliminating isolation and bringing everyone together. There's power in our choices that when we pour resources where value is, we can transform the world. That's a wonderful microcosm of what can happen inside this country. You look at this, that's powerful, that's there. That another one, Alma Farms, that's based inside of California, that they exist to reclaim the lives of formerly incarcerated people, repurpose urban land into productive urban farm plots, and reimagine disenfranchised community. They're actually located around the corner from where I grew up. <laughs> that's there. Another one, look at community gardens in this research report. Higher levels of resiliency and optimism than non-gardening control groups. These novel results indicate that some potential for mental health benefits in urban environments, specifically in terms of well-being and resiliency. We have to engage in what's called moral determinants of health. We talk about social determinants of health. What are our morals? What's our goal? It's bigger than that. We have to realize the fact we have to, if we want to transform, we have to change the process of what's in that soil, of what we're feeding that soil. What's the fertilizer? The fruits are just going to be a manifestation of what's being poured in. And we have to really make a concerted effort across the board. It's very similar to a cardiologist, ouch, talking to myself, looking at the coronary arteries as if three vessels, the image on the left, right, as opposed to the, the rich complexity of roots and vessels that are there. Thinking that I'm putting a stent and that's resolving things, it's like putting a Band-Aid over social issues that exist. We have to get to the root of the problem that's there. And that's why I appreciate the work that Ron is doing. That's what we're trying to do locally in my own venue, too, as well, really trying to push the dial forward in terms of, of reinvigorating the community. 
we want to continue to support Ethos and everything that they're doing. We're also hopeful that you all will support too as well the HELP Conference, um, which is Health Equity Lifestyle Project, where what we're looking to do is bring in experts to really address the social ills that are there and address from a, a medical standpoint. But here's the key difference is that on day two, we're actually talking about what's the role of businesses? What's the role of places of faith? What's the role of place of higher education? What's the role of politics in really changing our culture so we can move the Dow forward so our kids have a better place to live and play and pray than what we do right now? Thank you, guys. Wow. Amazing. Unbelievable. Okay, once again, who learned something? Yep, you got it. Um, Ethos is about community, and it's an expanding community. And how many people here are New Jersey residents? You showed me this before when Dr. Okay, we have a great senator, right? Everyone know Cory Booker? One thing we could do to help a member of our community, the HELP Conference, we want to try to get Cory Booker to attend the HELP Conference. Yes. Cory Booker is very responsive to citizens who are engaged and speak their minds. So, if you have it within you to simply write your senator, Cory Booker, say that you saw Dr. Batiste today, because unfortunately they're not overlapping. Dr. Batiste has to leave tomorrow, and Cory's going to be here tomorrow, otherwise we'd sync them up personally, and just simply say, this would be a great event for you to attend. If we get five or 10 of us or 20 or 30 of us to do it, that's the power of community, right? Because we make the change. Our leaders reflect us, not the other way around, for better or for worse. So your help with that would be great. Now we got questions and answers for Dr. Batiste. I'm, I'm curious, hey. since you're a cardiologist, how do you, and they don't teach nutrition in school, how do you know so much about nutrition huh. and food? <laughs> Well, you know, I think all of us, we reach an impasse in life where either life, personal or professional life events occur and you realize that what you're doing isn't enough, right? And so being a student, a student, a perpetual student, I just really started digging into the research. It started off as trolling all the greats and then it evolved into looking at their research and then looked, evolved into looking at the research of the researchers and then trying to understand and apply it and as it relates to cardiovascular disease, it's such an easy connection um, and the burden in the community. And so that's where I felt was important. I felt was important. So that's, that's I don't know that I know as much as Dr. Weiss, but I, you know, I, I'm constantly perpetually learning, perpetually learning. The role of, of wine, mm -hmm. there's been, you know, the, even in the blue zones, and I watched it, it was marvelous, but they show you community and they show you a lot of wine. Um, and the doctors on the cruise, when we had the questions and answers, again, what does the role of wine, liquor have to do with our cardiovascular or our overall health? And um, love you to answer that again. Yeah, I think, I think my standpoint is, once again, no judgment, it's an issue of why a person is doing it. So if they're using it as a means to, when we talk about stress is demands minus resources, and they're stressed, so I need a glass of wine, or I'm stressed, so I need a beer, I'm wondering, are you using it to medicate yourself in that moment, and we're avoiding the greater problem? If I'm using it because of social issues that are there, and I just feel the need to have some, and I'm not worried, that may be okay. But when we look from a strictly health perspective, we don't need wine to improve heart health at all. We know that resveratrol is found inside of fruits, it's found inside of, of nuts too as well. That's not required at, at all. When we look at the impact of alcohol and increasing studies starting to tell us about the impact on cancer, breast cancer and other issues, and I'm looking at am I adding to my resiliency or adding to my stress? Health equals resiliency or stress, am I adding to it? For me, the evidence is tilting towards, is I'm adding to my stress as opposed to my resiliency. And so for myself, that's not something I do on a personal level and I don't advise my patients to do. When I look at large scales, I wonder, is it part of the socialization, that, isol that, that, that community that's happening that really is equating to longevity or is it truly something specific in the alcohol itself? 
Um, so those are the questions. I, I think you know, we're continuing to do research, continuing to explore and look, but right now, as I'm saying, for the weight of evidence as I see it, it toxicity from irregular heartbeats, atrial fibrillation, for cardiomyopathy, um, it's the burden of risk is not worth it in my, from my perspective. A question from the digital world. Can you explain why lowering cholesterol, high blood pressure, or A12 with medication is not the same as lowering with a plant-based diet? The quick, simple answer is you're not treating the underlying cause. So what happens if all of a sudden you stop taking the medications, all right? If I punch a hole in the wall and I cover it up with a pitcher, that hole is still there. I haven't really transformed anything. So we're, part of the issue is trying to get to like the mechanism of what's the problem. And we're feeding the problem with, with foods that are not as ideal as it relates to it. So whether or not it's the issues of high sol sodium, of high saturated fat, triggering the, the, the gut microbiome. It's such a complexity. Our impression and our plan are different. So we're saying, I want to be rich by spending all my money. That doesn't, make any, that doesn't make any sense. We have to kind of be very consistent in terms of what our plan is, and we have to make those, those adjustments. My wife just actually called me with a friend of hers at, at her conference. She's away at a conference, couldn't be here right now. And her friend told me that she was diagnosed with diabetes, diagnosed with high blood pressure, and that her insurance company, which I thought I heard good things about, that they have a program that can help patients to lower their insurance costs by putting them through a lifestyle, a lifestyle program that they told this young lady to go on a ketogenic diet. And as she started developing increased burden of chest discomfort, unknown in terms of her risk profile, and so it, it becomes important. It's not just about the pills. She's on pills, but that's not the answer. It's not the sole answer. You can't do anything you want and take pills as the sole answer. Hi, thank you. Um, how do you work with your patients to transition them, motivate them, and educate them? Yeah, I think first thing is just, you know, I respect, I'm, I try and show respect to them, number one. And what that means is, is I, I let them know that there's a better option. I try and find out first what is their why, what's the, what is it that they want, right? And so Kelly McGonigal has a great book, right? And so in her book, The Willpower Instinct, she talks about, I love the three little statements. What do you want? What are you willing to do to get what you want? And what won't you do to get what you want? Simple. So I start there. And then the next goal is I try and begin to, a pathway of meeting them where they're at. So I'll be honest, I used to come out the, the gate guns blazing. You gotta go whole food, plant-based, no oil, no salt, no sugar, da, 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 da. And here's where you're gonna go, right? I never forget meeting this one patient who, um, who looked at me and was like, Doc, I live in a small apartment. I'm barely making my rent. I tell the landlord, but there's cockroaches around. I can't really keep anything fresh. I stopped in that moment to really sit and meet him where he was at. And this was the birthplace of what I called no cooking cooking class I used to do. And I was like, okay, we're going to change up. We're going to go frozen. We're going to go canned. BPA-free cans. We're going to start to kind of make, I said, let's list of what's available in your neighborhood you normally go to. Here's the better options for you. I met him where he was at and then begin that process of building upon that to help him. And so I think that's what we all have to do, but that takes time. That takes a level of empathy and care and concern and recognition that it's not his fault, right? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, where his, his current state is, but his state is, where his, his state is his current state. So we need to address it in that moment. So that's, that's my approach. Coconut oil, I know, is like a medium chain fat, so I thought that it was supposed to be healthy, but the limit of, say, coconut oil and also sea salt, I know, is healthier than regular salt, but is there a limit of sea salt and then the saturated fat with coconut oil? Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the things that I've seen, that's a great question, by the way, and there's one thing I have to kind of tell you is that there's a spectrum, and everyone's health journey is going to be slightly different in terms of what they, the impact that's there and the amount of studies that really will validate a definitive answer. My, what my bias is, is that I tend to lend, lead people away from eating processed fats and try to lead them towards more whole food fats. Now, that's not always easy. But in my experience, in my practice, most people are engaging in processed fats, i.e. oils, to fry. 
and they're increasing the boiling point and they're not using it just to kind of add a little bit of flavor, they're actually frying inside of it, which I don't want them to do for an area in which I didn't discuss today, advanced glycation in products, a lot of byproducts that are there that cause a lot of damage and harm. So I tend to lead people away from that as opposed to towards it in general. And so that's one of the major issues I have with the oil. So it's not the fat by itself. Yes, it does impair the endothelium, but there's some varying questions. I haven't seen one specifically looking at coconut oil itself on the endothelial function. In terms of the crystallization of sodium with the different types of salt, typically what we end up having, that was not elucidated in terms of the literature looking at the impairment. The problem with sodium and salt is that it impacts everything. We think of it just for water retention. We think of it just in terms of raising blood pressure. It impacts the kidneys. It impacts definitely the lining of the vessels. It impacts the heart itself, the way the heart contracts. So I do minimize, I, t I tell folks to measure their salt is what I tell them to do. I tell them don't cook by ear. So my, my grandmother and my mother, they cook by ear. Just sprinkle a little bit of this, oh, that's good. A little more of this. No, measure it out so you know precisely what's inside of it, what you're adding so you have a, a concept. And I would recommend the same thing if, if that's your, your perspective in terms of like oil and so forth. Measure it out to get a sense because one tablespoon or one ounce is about 250 calories. We know the impact of it and starting to go down that road. What is your success rate within your practice of getting your patients to adopt this lifestyle? I'm a horrible fisher to use that, that analogy, right? So they tell me yes, they do this. No, no, right? But every once in a while, I'll get someone who says yes, and they have tremendous success. And I'm like, I'll leave with this greatest story that I had, and this was someone where I gave a talk when I was doing the lectures. I didn't get a chance to meet her, and she wasn't my personal patient at that time. But she listened, I didn't culture, I didn't give her anything. And she started following what I said in the lecture and dropped like 100 pounds, her blood pressure normalized. She had ended up developing and she came to see me, got forced to a referral because she said, I'm just losing too much weight. And I was like, okay, you need to add some carbs. Carbs are not bad, just not garbage. And, and so she did phenomenally. And so it's, it's not about the masses for me. So I'll be honest, if Dr. Weiss had two people here, I was still going to fly out and be inside of the and be inside the uh, the airport, right? It's not it's not it's not about the masses. It's about the message and delivering the care. When you look at the the impact of what's the compliance for medications, it's poor as well. In the United States uh, people prescribe it all the time. So I appreciate you guys your time listening. I'll be back there as well. Give it up for Dr. Batiste. Thank you so much.